Philippians chapter number 4. We're going to begin reading in verse number 9. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through, through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. And we'll stop reading there. Now, if you go, I don't know, what, nine, eight or nine verses later, you're going to see that this epistle was written to the Philippi, uh, Philippians. I almost said Philippines because I looked over there and saw Brother J.D. To the Philippians from Rome while the Apostle Paul is in bondage. Yeah, that's why in verse number 12, or I'm sorry, in verse number 11, okay, he's talking about not that I speak out of need, but he is talking about them providing some of the things that he did need. He says, in fact, he says, I'm happy you did it. Not because he was needy, but I mean, we can go down and pick up reading afterwards, and you're going to find, he says, I, I don't ask, and I'm not happy that you've given for my sake, but I'm happy that you've done it, because now you're going to get a reward for it from God. You're going to be blessed and honored for taking care of the man of God. But, he's not writing them a bunch of letters saying, hey, need a new coat, hey, need a little bit of food, hey, you know, I'm in bondage. It'd be great if y'all could spring a riot or something and get me out of this. I mean, he's not interested in any of that. And we find evidence as to why in these verses. Now, verse number 9, he's telling them, hey, whatever, whatever you've heard, whatever's written, which, you know, this would be this letter, everything else that he may have written to them that wasn't recorded into the Bible, everything that Timothy heard Paul preach that he might have, you know, brought through one Sunday morning if he was traveling through town. He's saying, whatever you've heard preached, whatever you've heard delivered from God, whatever you've seen in me, whatever you've seen in other godly people, do that. Now, why did we read that verse? Because... The Apostle Paul, as he goes on to say here, he's saying, hey, what have you seen me do? He didn't have a handout. In fact, when he went among the Gentiles, many a times he didn't even ask or didn't receive anything from them because he didn't want to look like a gainsayer that he would preach in order to get. That's why we find him often mending nets, doing odds and ends to make ends meet or to get enough money to put food on the table because he says, I didn't want that to be a hindrance to the gospel. He's saying, so you've seen me do that. But he's also telling them, he says, verse number 10, I, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again. He said, I know this isn't the first time. But he's saying, I know it's going to be the last. The apostle Paul knows he's got to stand before Caesar, but he also knows he's going to be out of here pretty quick. He's not long for this earth. That's why he says, here at the last, your kindness, your generosity, your love has been made known again. He's saying, it's not the first time that you've given to me, but I do know it's going to be the last time. Well, what's that? Tell us here. He's saying, well, what are you seeing in the Apostle Paul there? He knows that the end's in there, but he isn't he isn't done. He's still keeping on, keeping on. We find that the Apostle Paul, when he was in Rome, that the centurion arranged it to where he had his own private housing. What's he doing? He's holding church every day. Anybody that wants to come here, the Apostle Paul, he's going to preach to them. He's saying, I'm thankful for what you're giving to it because in the meantime, while I'm waiting on this trial to go through with Caesar, or while I'm in jail awaiting a verdict or whatever it is, I'm just going to keep doing and what you've given is going to allow that to continue maybe they provided the parchment and the ink for him to write another epistle do a different church I don't know but I do know that in the beginning the Philippians were the only ones that were willing to stand by you find that in the verses after this 
Verse number 16, for even at Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity. Why? Because at the end of verse number 15, that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. In other words, there was a time that these were the only people that could have met the needs of the Apostle Paul. And they did. And then there was a time when many helped, but now, at the end, they showed their love and their faithfulness. Maybe they hit a dry spot. Maybe God knew that they wouldn't be able to, but they always desired to. Why do you think they learned that from the Apostle Paul? Thick and thick. He just got bit by a snake over on this island, a whole bunch of barbarians around. They just shook it off. I'd have been trying to hunt down and kill every snake on that stupid island. Why? Because I didn't want to happen again. It didn't bother him. Keep in mind, he just came through one of the worst storms, I guarantee you, that anybody on that boat had ever seen. And where do you find him at? He's over there talking to God on the other side of the boat. They're all throwing everything off of the boat. They're taking the tackling off. If it wasn't nailed down, they got rid of it to try and let this boat keep floating. And he's just over there talking to God. He says, hey, first off, told y'all we shouldn't set sail. But now that we have set sail, as long as none of y'all get off of the boat, nobody's going to die. They said, we're going to lose the boat, but we're not going to lose anybody. But why did we bring all that up? The Philippians know them stories. They've heard about the life of the apostles. The church got started after him and Silas one night had themselves a revival in prison and God sent an earthquake and opened everything up and God had to be in it because none of the prisoners ran out. And then the Philippian jailer and his whole house get saved. Who do you think you know, started the church? It started in that man's house. Other people heard about what God had done for Paul, what God had used Paul to preach. He's saying, hey, y'all have seen a lot of stuff. You've heard a lot of stuff about me. But one thing that they hadn't heard, because he wrote it here, but he's saying from now on, y'all do this. Well, verse number 11, not that I speak in need for, for I've learned and whatsoever said I am therewith to be content. I preached out that verse on there are some things that we ought not be content with. We ought not be content with people still dying and going to hell. And so, but that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about with physical possession. He's talking about with his needs being met. He's talking about thick or thin, whether there's money in the bank or not money in the bank. He's saying, I've learned to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. He didn't say, I'm working on it, Brother Brian. He said in verse number 12, I know both. How to do both of these things. Not, I'm pretty good at one and then working on the other. He's saying, I've mastered both of them. I know. But what has he mastered? He's mastered how to abound, but also how to be abased. A lot of people nowadays don't know how to do either one of them. A lot of people nowadays don't even give thought to either one of them. Now to be abound, a that doesn't mean you're the richest guy in town. Abound doesn't mean that everything that comes up in your life, you can fix it by throwing you know, money, time, or effort at it. And you've, you can take care of it you know, without losing that much of your attention, your time, your effort. Right? It's not going to be much for you to take care of. That's, that's not what abounding is. Abounding means all your needs are met and you're still able to have above that. Doesn't, doesn't specify. But if your needs are met and you've been blessed above that, you're abounding. You know what a base is? That's where you got the bare necessities, as the Jungle Book would say. You may be going to bed hungry, but you're going to wake up the next day. You're abased. God will, I mean, the Bible says, we ought not ask for our needs. God's going to provide them to us. We've received the adoption of sonship. Did God not provide Jesus with food when Jesus was on the earth? He'll take care of our needs too. But the Bible does say having food and raiment to be content therewith. It doesn't say house. Jesus didn't even have a pillow most of the time. He laid his head on rocks. One of the few times that we do find him asleep, the boat's filled up with water. 
They came and woke him up and said, Master, we're, per we're going to perish. The boat's full of water, is what the Bible said. But even in that situation, God's going to take care of the boat because the son was in the boat. But when he looks at you, if you're saved, he sees the son. So he'll take care of the need. But the needs may not be met the way that we believe that they ought to be met. But a base does not mean that you don't have nothing. It just means that you've got what God wants you to have and that's pretty much it. You may, like them old cartoons, go to open up the wallet and then moths fly out. Right? Or you feel like every time you walk outside there's a road runner dropping an anvil on your head. Right? You went to pick up a candle and there's a stick of dynamite. A base means there's a whole bunch of problems... But the reason that he used the word abate is because those experiences are too humble. They are to abase us. We are not in a base state. We're joint heirs of the throne. But the situation is there to abase us. And then when we abound, it is not our riches that are, you know, shake down, press, bubbling over. It is an opportunity for us to go and abound, tell many what God has done for us. Because you can be abased and abound at the same time. You don't believe me? We can go to Acts. We're not going to because I'm not going to read 900 verses this morning. But we can go over to the book of Acts where this church got started. And they're in the inner prison, Paul and Silas. I guarantee you after they beat them, they didn't feed them. I guarantee you after they beat them, they didn't dress their wounds. They threw them into the inner prison hoping that they would die before the trial happened. No, count, or no telling how many times they got hit with the cat and nine tails, how many stripes were laid upon them. They might have tried to stone Paul again. But I do know they didn't like them and they was trying to get rid of them. They knew they couldn't kill them under their law, so they did everything but that. Then threw them into the dirtiest, you know, most awful place in the prison, the inner prison, hoping that they'd probably die from infection with their wounds. Because they were chained hand and foot to the wall. That meant that they were laying on their backs in all the muck and the mire of this prison. They were abased in their surroundings, but yet they abounded. Because in all the pain and all the situation, I guarantee you it was pitch black in the middle of it. The Bible says it was at night. Pitch black in the middle of it. What, what did they start doing? Well, first they started praying, then they started praising. But they, well, they were abased, but then they also abounded. And with the Lord's help this morning, we're going to te teach on knowing how to be abased and how to abound. Because you can't walk the Christian life that God wants you to live unless you know how to do both. Now there are two types of people. There are people that base their spirituality off of things that they have. And that's more than money. We're going to get into it. And then there are those that base their spirituality off of where they know they are with God. Well, where's God at? Well, right here. Job said, I look in front of me left, right, behind I looked everywhere that I could and couldn't find him but he knoweth the way that I take I know that he's on our side God be for us who can be against us Paul's saying I'm not the one that gives me the strength to get through those times where I'm abased I'm not the one that gives me the strength the one I don't feel like it but God opens the opportunity for me to abound you know I have the strength to go do that who does that? well next verse I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me I can be abased, I can abound, I can be somewhere in the middle, but Christ is going to give me the strength to deal with both of them. It may be a rough road, but he's going to give me all that I need to get it walked, is what he's saying. To hand out that next track. To go and to just testify one more time to somebody that may have heard it more than a few times. But if it's what he wants me to do, he'll give me the strength to do it. So let's look at this first group of people. Those that base their spirituality or base their entire outlook on life on things that they have. 
you do realize that the Apostle Paul, before God saved him, called him to be the twelfth apostle when he was Saul, he's a pretty big, you know, fella in social circles. Studied under the greatest educator of, of the time. In other words, he had a green light from everybody to one day be one of the you know highest of the highs. One of the people that controlled a lot of things. Even at that point, he's at the point where he doesn't have to go out and stone people. He's holding the jackets of people that are stoning people. He's, he's giving the orders. On the road to Damascus, he had the papers. He was the one that was going to go and stir up all the trouble against the Christians. Well, he was a ringleader. He wasn't a follower. Right? But because of his position, being Pharisee, he said he was, you know, in Hebrew of the Hebrews. Right? People looked at him and said, wow, that's what we ought to be. But with that, he had a whole bunch of acquaintances. First, he had the other Pharisees. In order to be a Pharisee, he had to have a wife. Okay, well, then there's the family relations. Then there's everybody that's trying to, you know, bump elbows and rub elbows with him. Right? He was a popular man. You know what happened on that road to Damascus? Nothing. They all disowned him. In fact, you'll find later on that, I mean, our pastor brought it out one time, you'll find that, you know, people that, I'm not going to get on who, but a whole bunch of people look down their noses at people that have been divorced, you know, vote them out of church, kick them out and everything. Well, the apostle, Paul, his wife divorced him. Because in order to be a Pharisee, you had to be married. But then later on he writes that he would, that all men would be like him. But what was that? Not married. That the widows stay widows. That the young men, if they can contain it, you know, don't give themselves over to the desires of the flesh. What's he saying? He, he was single. He didn't used to be because he was a Pharisee. And he kept the law. He was in Hebrew with the Hebrew. He didn't just lose, he lost family. But there are people that base their spirituality off of, well, who's talking to him and who's not? Who's happy with me and who's not? Did I get a pat on the back from the pastor this week? There are people that if they can't get somebody on the phone or if they can't get a response from somebody on Facebook, their week is ruined because nobody wants to listen to their problems. You know what the Apostle Paul figured out? Jesus is always there to listen. You know what the Apostle Paul figured out? When nobody else cares, he does. When everybody else walked out, Jesus walked in on them. In fact, Jesus stopped them on the road and blinded them for a few days because Paul got such a good look at them. Well, there are times that we will abound. We'll look around and we'll have friends everywhere so-called friends sometimes they really are friends, but there will be other times that we'll be abased you telling me that if one of the other 11 apostles was with the apostle Paul they wouldn't have done what they could to you know help the apostle Paul in this situation but God split them and put them in two different directions there may be times that I want to help you but I cannot maybe because we're been separated by distance maybe because I'm the guy that likes to stay out of the loop and I don't hear about things and unless you tell me directly I'm not going to know about it maybe because something happened so quickly and so spontaneous nobody can help you with what just happened except for God what's that? well when it comes to the people around you when it comes to socially you've been abased the question is do you know how to be abased and still be spiritual and abound and still be spiritual because the key to being spiritual when you're abounding when people are all around you is not focusing on the people it's focusing on God you know what the key to being successful when you've been abased and there's nobody still relying on God to get you through it if you can't do one you won't be able to do the other because the key to both is the same I must decrease he must increase why because I am abased to remind me it's not about me it's about him this is the apostle Paul we're talking about here even before he penned this letter to the, the, the church at Philippi 
How many people has he seen saved? That God show up after he's been preaching? Or maybe a different preacher because we know that Luke traveled with him for a while. We know that these other preachers are traveling with him for a while. I mean, this is after the point that he's preaching one night until midnight. The guy fell out the window. He went up and then touched the guy. And then he got up and he was alive again. Right, the Apostle Paul had seen some things, but guess where he's at right now? He's in prison. He's still abased. Why? Because maybe, I don't know. But I know that the Apostle Paul was human. I know how my flesh gets. You have a good day, and good day, it's a relative term. Okay? You can strike out for three months straight, but if you get a hit, it's the best day of your life. Your batting average is still awful, but that day you feel pretty great. Yeah. Right? Lord help you, you hit a double instead of a single. Right? You're unstoppable. You're bulletproof. Well, you know what the problem with that is? You think it, but it's not true. Maybe because you had struck out so many times, they brought in like the guy from single A, not even triple A. They were like, we're going to give everybody else a day off. We know that this guy can't hit. Right? Well, there's days you're going to feel like the world's running you over and running you over. You're going to feel like even though you're praying, your prayers don't get above the ceiling. There are going to be days that you feel abased, but just because you have a glimmer, a spark, what's that meant to do? To keep that fire deep down in your soul burning. It's not meant to puff up our egos. We have to learn how to be abased. And we may need to be reminded every now and then because the Apostle Paul knew it wasn't about him. But when he was humbled, God got more glory. I mean, the Apostle Paul is the one that wrote to us that he learned that God's grace is made perfect in weakness. He understood the weaker he got, the more glory God got. So he, he said, Lord, I'm yours, hook, line, and sinker. Whatever you want to do with me, do it so that you get the glory for it. See, he knew how to be abased. And he accepted it. Why? Because he didn't look around and base his position off of how many people were coming to those church services that he was having when he was in you know, confinement in his house that the centurion rendered for him. He wasn't basing his success as a missionary off of how many people beat him when he was in the jail here in Philippi. He wasn't basing his success... Or looking around and judging his success based off of how many times they had stoned him or beaten him. He based his success off of, did I do what God told me to do? Amen. Not only did I do it, what God told me to do, did I do it the way that God wanted me to do it? Did I do it with all that was within me? Did I give God my best as I did it? You want to know where he learned how to do them things? When he was abased. But Bob, how many Christians nowadays do you think would hang around if the day that they got saved, God blinded them? And then they had to go shack up with somebody that they had never met before for a few days and then go face the people that they had talked about and persecuted and tried to kill a few times and then one say, hey, sorry about that, but also I was wrong and uh, now I understand that you guys are the right ones and God wants me to be an apostle. I don't think we'd have many converts nowadays, Brother J.D. But one of the first lessons that the Apostle Paul learned was, I've, I understand that God's, God's big enough to take care of me when I'm at the lowest. But why did he say, I mean, he just told them, do the things that you've heard me preach, that you've seen in me, that you've read, that I've written to you. Do them, keep them, because they're going to keep you on the straight and narrow. Why then did he say, I know how to be abased? Because really what he's saying is, I know that when God, you know, seemingly knocks the blocks out from underneath me, he's getting ready to show up and do something big. Because when the world looks at me and can't figure out how or why or what's keeping me going, when they look at me and they say, that's the lowest of the low, but he's, something's happening over there. It can't be him, because nobody in their right mind will listen to that guy talk. Right? Nobody that looks like that or dresses like that or reads the Bible that he does, that can't help nobody but when people get help. We do know that some of Caesar's own family got saved. Where do you think they heard 
the Apostle Paul? I don't know how many kings the Apostle Paul might have gotten to preach to, but I know that he almost convinced Agrippa. I know that Festus, the one who brought him to Agrippa, was pretty convinced by him. He was convinced enough not to execute him like the Jews wanted him to do. He said, no, I believe that's a good man. They talk. They run him down. He says, I've heard them say things about him that I didn't even think you know, were words until I heard them say, come out of these guys' mouth. He said, they were inventing stuff to charge him with. He says, but I don't see anything wrong with him. What's all that? He was abased. But when the world can't make sense of it, God gets more glory for it. The Apostle Paul, he's already said, I had a thorn in flesh. God wouldn't move. Then he really found out how good grace was after God said, no, I'm not going to remove the thorn. After he said to remove it three times. Then he really started getting what grace was really about. Then when he understood that, he said, oh. It's one thing to know that God's grace is going to be good. It's another thing to live like you actually believe it. That when the props get knocked out from underneath of you. When the things that you thought made your life important are gone. And you still understand that God's grace and His mercy, even when you're abased, He's going to use it to get glory out of it. The Apostle Paul said, I know how to do that. Not because I'm anything special. He's just saying, I've learned that I'm just going to lean on God. Because I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. The strength of Christ is enough for me to face anything, is what he's saying. But then there's the opposite of that. Because some people read this and they say, well, abounding, that's, that's when everything's easy. Oh, you think so? You do know that the servant that was entrusted with ten silver coins instead of one, he had ten times the worries, ten times the stress, Ten times the amount of investment going on. The reason he was entrusted with much is because the master trusted him. But he also had more responsibility. The Apostle Paul was hurting in the jail that night, but the Apostle Paul didn't have to preach to nobody that night when he was in this jail in Philippi. He didn't have to lead any prayer meetings. All right, he was obey God made the situation real simple. He said, there's nothing we can do except pray. Start praising God. Whether God sent the earthquake or not, I believe they'd have done it. But see, there are other times where they're walking through the market in Athens and they want to make them a, you know, a deity. They want to build a temple to him and Barnabas. Jupiter and Mercury, I believe. Jupiter and Mercury. But, well, why? Well, on that day, there was a mob. That day, he had to preach to a whole bunch of people. In the work, he was abounding, but I guarantee in the flesh, he was weak. But, well, very few people in here know, but some people in here tell you, getting up here and pray, it's not all sunshine and roses. I don't know if you can tell, this is pretty soaked through right now. In fact, I, this was a three-piece suit. I took the vest off because I started sweating when I put the suit on today. Right, just thinking about this. But then afterward, I, I can never explain it. But Josh... He's not back from jail yet. I've talked to him about this before. He said, yes, yeah, the same way for me. As soon as I'm done teaching, it doesn't matter what time it is. It doesn't matter if I go five minutes and tag team or whether I go an hour and 15 down in Mexico like I did that one time because they just wouldn't let me stop. Doesn't matter how long, I'm done. Zero gas in the tank as soon as I'd step off the pulpit. I'm th I could take a nap, eat a snack, take a nap. Doesn't matter what time. I'm just, can't explain it. But it's just like God gave it to me, I gave it out, and then I'm done. I'm good. I've, got, I've usually got like five to seven minutes over there to find enough caffeine or sugar or something to get me through the rest of church in the morning. Which really, I'm not drinking caffeine or sugar or anything else because right around the time that the music starts playing, Brother Ray starts singing the next congregational, there's something down in here that gives me enough energy to get through the rest of church. But see, it's not always easy getting up and getting to do what you wanted to do. I wouldn't do anything else. But I mean, it'll take a little bit out of you. Amen. Right? Go, you may desire all week long to go out on visitation. Well, what if it's 110 and the heat index is more than that because in the summer we got El Nino or whatever it was and the humidity is 900. Right? What if you wanted to testify to somebody but you've got to do it when other people except that person are around and in the flesh you're intimidated by it. 
Spiritually, you're abounding because God's opening doors. But personally, you can be terrified. You can be exhausted. You can grow weary in well-doing. And just because it all looks like it doesn't mean that it's all easy. Right? Abounding is what other people see when they look at you. Abased is what other people see when they look at you. But the Apostle Paul said, no matter what you think the situation's like, I know how to do both of them. Because really, both of them, from my point of view, are the same. I'm leaning on God. It's whatever He wants. And if He opens the door, I may be tired. I may have a thorn in the flesh. I may be in prison. I may be at the jailer's house just wanting to get patched up. But while I'm there, might as well share the gospel with the rest of his family. Right? You really think that in the flesh the Apostle Paul felt like preaching as he's getting all the muck and the mire scraped out of the wounds, then having the oil poured in them, or, you know, if all that they had was salt, I preach on what we are the salt of the earth. Sometimes salt hurts because it can clean out wounds. It's not enjoyable, but it can. I don't know what they had to disinfect, but I guarantee you it wasn't enjoyable. It wasn't light king. They didn't numb him up first. But after hours of sitting there, all of it scabbed over. You got to get rid of all that. That wasn't enjoyable. But in the middle of it, he's still sharing the gospel with that jailer's family. The world would say, well, he wasn't abounding, but spiritually he was. Even when it was dry, what do you find him doing? Doing what God wants him to do. He's saying that's the same. Because most people don't think that it does take effort. It does take energy. It does take sacrifice even when things are abounding to keep doing what God wants you to do. And the Apostle Paul said, I can do all things through Christ. Which strengthens, he said, strengthens me when I'm abased and when I'm abounding. Because he understood the flesh is always going to fight. The world's always going to fight. Whether other people think that everything's good or everything's bad, it's going to take effort. It's going to take determination. It's going to take consecration and sanctification so that you can be what God wants you to be. You know what all that takes? Strength. And he's saying, I believe that God's going to take care of my need. And he's saying, He always has, He always will. But he's saying, I also believe that God's going to open up all the opportunities that he wants me to take advantage of. And I believe that whether I feel like it or not, whether I feel like I've got the strength to do it, I believe that God's going to give me the strength to do it. He doesn't say, I hope I can do all things. I can. Because he knew how to be abased and how to abound. Let's see, too many people base their situation off how much is in the bank. How many bills they've crossed off of the list and how many days there is until the next paycheck to cross off the rest of them. Some people base everything off of how many, you know, hands were raised in the service of people that said that they were lost and how many people claimed that they got saved. I don't know. That's between them and God. But some people are all about numbers. Some people are all about getting results. Very few people are interested in planting and watering, but waiting on God to give the increase. Some people are all interested in the opinions of others. Some people are just interested in positions. Because they think that abounding is having everything that they ever wanted. They never stop to consider that what they want might be what keeps them out of the will of God. In their mind, they're abounding, but in reality, they're far from God. Because all they care about is a title. Or all they care about is the position, or doing this is what they wanted so much they're willing to junk everything else for it. Like I said, abased and abounding, that's not what I think. He's saying, you think that I'm abased, you think that I'm abounding, but I'm the same all the time. I just got him. And he's enough for me, whether things are thin or whether things are thick. But he's saying, I don't care what other people see. I'm more interested in getting to know the Savior more today than I did yesterday. Because again, 
my spirituality. I can't say that spiritually I'm abased. I've got him. The one that God bankrupt heaven to be born of a virgin, to die on the cross, shed his blood for he paid for it before I was ever born, regardless of whether or not I ever would have accepted him. And now I have him, and I'm robed in his righteousness. I've been made to join heir to his throne. Spiritually, I'm not bankrupt. No matter how bad it gets, if we're honest, you cannot be abased spiritually. You cannot look at yourself and say, you know what, I have less today spiritually than I did yesterday. You have the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. It's whether or not we take advantage of all the opportunities that He gives to us. You can take everything away from Him, you can't take Him. So when people ask you, well, hey, how's things going? You, we cannot be abased spiritually. In the flesh we can, but spiritually the apostle is saying, that's all that matters to me. I don't care about what happens to this flesh. I mean, they're getting ready to actually, he says here at the last, he knows this time's up. He wrote elsewhere, I fought a good fight, finished my course. What's he saying? He's saying, I know the end's coming for me. But he's saying, learn the lesson that I learned. It's not about what the flesh feels, not about what the world, when they look at he's saying, you've got it all already. You cannot be abased if you've got him. And he's saying, that's where all of my value and all of my stock is. That's why when the world says, well, how can you do it when you're out there mending nets? He says, because I've got him. Amen. But Paul, how, how were you able to preach all the way to midnight? Because i got him. Paul, how did you make that long journey? I mean, I don't know if your Bible's like mine, Nate plotted out their best guess of where they thought the towns were in Paul's missionary journeys God did a whole lot of traveling even by today's standards and he did it by boat and by cart and by foot and say you walked on how'd you do that I got him the world may look on the external but our value on what we have should always be internal other people base their spirituality and whether or not they're based in a bounty based off of what they have outwardly but a true Christian will base whether they're based or a bounty off of what they have inwardly because these treasures I mean we ought to lay up treasures in heaven gold, silver, precious you know what that means no matter how hot the world gets those things are staying Amen. they may get a little melted but God doesn't give us anything that he won't enable us to keep so instead of one gold bar, you might have two piles of melted gold, but you still got the gold. You know what it just proves? That it was real. Because if it wasn't all gold, there wouldn't be two piles of gold. There'd be a little bit of gold, and then whatever was on the inside was likely lead, because it's about the only thing heavy is gold. It's what they claim that Fort Knox had down there all them years ago. Just gold bars with lead in the middle. There's a whole bunch of people that when things get hot, they realize, I wasn't abounding. Because they've got one hand full of lead and they've got a tiny bit of gold. But no matter how hot it gets, if you've got him, the silver's still going to be silver. The gold's still going to be gold. The precious gems are still going to be precious to you. That's why those ought to be our treasures. Why? Because that's abounding inwardly. And if you've got those, yeah, it may be hot, but I've still got him. Amen. Yeah, the gold may not look like it used to, but it's still gold. Still worth the world to me. Now, why did the apostle Paul? He says, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Because in both situations, to him, they're the same. Right? But then he goes on to say, Notwithstanding, ye have done well that ye did communicate with my affliction. Then we read verse number 15 that no church communicated with me is concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. Then. Verse number 17, not because I desire a gift, but because I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Now there we find that word again, abound to your account. If we abound inwardly, fruit will abound in our life. If you're down here realizing how much God's pressed down, shaking, and how much you really are bubbling over, there's going to be fruit. Fruit of the Spirit, 
And we're not talking about external fruit. If you labor, fields are wide unto harvest. God will give you fruit for your labor. May not be what the world thinks fruit is, but God's going to give you fruit. Jeremiah's got a whole lot of fruit. Noah's got a whole lot of fruit because they just did what God told them to do. Brother J.D. and I were talking about that last night. No converts that we have any record of, but guess what? They got fruit because they were faithful. But I'm talking about if you've got him down here and that's what you cherish, you're going to start sprouting fruit that looks like him. That's why at Antioch they were first called Christians. Because they had fruit that looked a whole lot like Christ's fruit. Where'd they get that? Because they were abounding inwardly and they had fruit that abounded on their account. You want to know why the church gave to Paul? Because they loved the man of God. They may not have always been able to, but when they were, they were going to make sure that the man of God was treated good. They were saying, he may be abased, but we're going to try and help him abound. He said, you don't realize, I've always been abounding. Inwardly. He says, but I'm thankful that he sent something. Not because he needed it. Not because he wanted it. He said, but now, because you're going to have more fruit on your account. It's going to abound on your account. The Apostle Paul saw what they gave him and said, you know what, thanks for it, but I'm happy that you sent it because God's going to bless you with more. They may not even been able to use it. What if they sent him a whole bunch of, what if they sent him a shirt that was too small? Well, God's going to still bless them with, because the, their desire was to provide for the, the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul spent a lot of time in, you know, captivity, but I mean, we find that he was treated well. He may have gotten, you know, a little bit bigger for his britches while he was in Rome and the centurions providing for him. I don't know. But you're telling me that because they didn't know that and they said in any way that God wouldn't have blessed No, of course, he's saying, I'm just thankful that God's going to bless you. You're going to have more fruit. Right, well, shortly. For those that look outwardly, my favorite book, Proverbs, chapter number 23, verse number 1, When thou sittest to eat with the ruler, consider diligently what is before thee. In other words, when you're hanging out with those that everybody else says, they've got everything that you could ever want. He says, consider what's before you diligently. Okay, verse number three. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. You know what dainty is? It's a delicacy. All right, that's caviar. That's that filet mignon. That's that fatted calf that everybody else says, oh man, I wish I could have that. Right? I don't want most of it because I found out all the stuff that people, you know, put a big price tag on, most of it tastes like garbage. Okay? I'm good with regular old steak. But he's saying, don't pay attention to the delicacies. For they are deceitful meat. Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. Meaning, lean on him. Because the flesh wants to be rich. Flesh wants to abound outwardly. But what is it? What are those outward dainties? Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away, as, fly away as an eagle toward heaven. You know what dainties do? Those delicacies do? They get eaten. They disappear. I don't know if it's like this for you, but you know what usually happens to the money in my bank account? It flies away pretty quick. <laughs> but I find things that either need to be paid or I like. And I want what non-monetary value the same way. You know what the first things to go are when times get hard? The things that you, those delicacies, those things that you desired the most. Why? Because usually those things require the most effort to maintain. They require the most money in order to keep, you know, those things coming in. What's the first thing that people usually cut when times get hard? The non-essentials. Right. How sad is it that Wi-Fi nowadays is considered an essential? But people ain't going to cut the Wi-Fi off, but you know what? They might cancel the TV. They might cancel, you know, some subscriptions. They might stop going to the movies. They might stop going out to eat as much. But there are some things that they're always going to hold on to. Proverbs is saying the things that you're always going to hold on to, those are the ones that you ought to invest your time into. You know what the Apostle Paul said? Those things are the things that cause me to spiritually abound. They're worth investing in. They're worth giving my time and my effort towards. Because if I invest in God, God will give me the strength to do what he has invested me with. Because we all have a role to do. 
God has given to you, He's invested His Son in you so that we bear fruit and we have much fruit abound to our account. But how do we have an abounding, you know, fruit abounding in our, we have to abound spiritually. Well, how do we do that? By giving everything over to Him. Then it doesn't matter what the world sees in our life. Then it doesn't matter where we find ourselves. Jesus is always just as good as He's always been. And we abound inwardly. Then what happens? Then the world will notice that we have fruit abounding in our life. Because we gave all that we could to God, like the Philippians. Whenever they could, they gave all that they could to the Apostle Paul. He's saying, I'm happy when those shipments come in. Because I know that God's going to give you more fruit for it. He's saying, I'm happy because you've taken after my example. You've given it all to God. And God's going to take it and do something with it. Then the world may say, well, you got, you got nothing. But you could say, nope, I know how to be at a base and know that I'll do a bound because I've got him. As long as I've got him, that's all I need. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.